my name is Isaac Kim from uh, Caltech, and today I'm going to talk about the pretty much a same kind of code with a similar property. Um, okay, so here's a general uh, picture of a energy barriers of the of many local quantum error correcting codes. Uh, as we already probably know that in 2D such as Tori code and color codes, we have particle-like excitations. So what we can have is uh, at, at finite temperature. Uh, there will be a non-zero probability that the particles and the antiparticles will be created and they will just diffuse away without extra energy cost. And if they make a non-contractible loop, and that will cause error. But we do know at the same time, uh, there is a four-dimensional system, which is a 40 tori code, uh, which is a finite energy barrier. And the way you can like visualize this is basically uh, the elementary particle excitation, elementary excitation looks like a closed string-like excitation with a finite string tension. So to cause a logical error, you actually need to stretch out the closed string all the way up until you uh, fill out the whole surface. And that's where we get the, um, the linear energy barrier. And in a 3D, uh, the natural generalization of um, lattice gauge models such as Tori codes can be basically thought in the pretty much the same way as in, same ways as in 2D. But uh, here, instead of uh, having a particle and particle, we have particles and string. But since we do have a particle anyway, uh, they will still cause a logical error. And this has been believed to be a general picture for a very long time until uh, last year, uh, Jiangwan Ha introduced a new kind of code. And as in the previous, in 2011, Bravian Ha showed that there is actually a logarithmic energy barrier for creating a logical error. So. Uh, just to have a brief recap of the previous talk, uh, I just want to ask the following question, uh, which is, in Haas code, where does the logarithmic energy barrier for the logical error comes from? And the answer turns out to be fairly simple, which is the existence of constant aspect ratio. So as you can see in this picture, on the top, um, on the top, the, the, this guy and this guy is pretty happy, whereas this guy is not so happy. And the, this, the reason why this guy is not so happy is because compared to the size of the anchor, uh, the distance between two anchors are too far away, which is not allowed by the model. And this is one of the defining properties of a Haas model. And we're going to look through models that are uh, more general codes that share the same kind of property. So the real question that I want to ask was obviously, are there similar kind of codes? And to think about this question, we uh, revisit how Ha um, found those codes, which is to basically, he found numerically after exhaustive search over binary stabilizer code with certain plausible assumptions, such as they have to commute, and they're translation invariant, and they have two stabilizer generators for each cube, et cetera. And our approach is going to be slightly different, because if we take the same approach, we're going to write the same code anyway. And the, primary difference is that we're going to search through a qdit stabilizer code instead of a qbit stabilizer code. And it turns out that the stabilizer formalism carries out pretty much the same way when the d is a prime number. So we will study a qpit quantum code, hence the explanation for the excited title. And uh, here are main differences between the Haas code and our code that I'm going to present. Uh, the first difference is that the local particle dimension in Haas code is two, whereas in my code it's a prime number in general. And in Haas code, uh, he has uh, two particles uh, per site, whereas in our code, we will have just one per site. And, uh, uh, we will, uh, and it'll be the same kind of lattice, a cubic lattice. But uh, instead of having two uh, generators for Haas code, which resulted in a CSS code, we'll just have one generator for each cube. So this will not be a CSS code. And uh, basically, for, uh, th there's a generic tool that is applicable in these kind of situations. And uh, the first thing that you should notice is that uh, instead of a X operator, uh, we should now consider a generalized shift operator X, and also a generalized phase operator Z, where omega corresponds to the Dth root of the unity. And uh, they um, satisfy the following quote unquote uh, commutation relation, which is encoded by the, and, and the one thing that you should remember is that the commutation relation of these generalized Pauli operator are completely encapsulated by the so-called symplectic product between the symplectic pairs alpha and beta. And the alpha and beta here is actually a uh, combination of two alpha 1 and alpha 2 and beta 1 and beta 2. So you can see from this relation that uh, two generalized Pauli operators commute with each other if and, o if and only if uh, the symplectic product bit is equal to 0 modulo d. Because then uh, omega to the d becomes exactly 1. And also for the multiples of d. 
So our stabilizer generator will look pretty much the same as in uh, Haskell. As you can see, we have the cubic generator, and we have eight, um, eight symplectic pairs. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, the uh, alpha will be a general uh, symplectic pair, which represents the generalized Pauli operators. And as in Haskell, we'll uh, consider a translation of u in three different directions, and also we'll assume a periodic boundary condition. And uh, you can see from the previous slide that u is a general unitary operator. And in when d is equal to 2, the nice thing about the Pauli operators are they're uh, not only unitary, but they're also Hermitian. But we don't have the luxury anymore in general d. So to actually write down the quantum many body Hamiltonian, you actually have to hermitize the unitary operator. And hence, the Hamiltonian becomes like the following, which is summed over all uh, cubes. And uh, if you think about it, uh, this generic model will not result in any kind of uh, meaningful code unless we, uh, unless we uh, supply some kind of constraints on it. For one thing, um, since we're studying a stabilizer code, uh, all the stabilizer generators would have to commute with each other, right? So that's the first condition that we're going to impose on the code. And the second condition is pretty much uh, the, proper, the defining property of Haas code, which is the absence of string logical operator. And uh, basically, there are many ways to interpret it. But uh, the way I um, understood Haas paper was only two steps. There are, there are really two steps in showing the absence of string logical operator. The first step is the so-called deformability condition. And uh, in Haas language, it was an eraser. And the basic idea is that if we have a sharp boundary on the logical operator, we can somehow smoothen it out into a, uh, into a more smoothened uh, surface. And the next one is the constant aspect ratio, which is that if we have a finite segment of the logical string operator, it cannot get too long. So once we take it for granted for these two facts about the code, then the basic logic behind how you show that there is no string logical operator is something like this. So let's suppose we have a string logical operator then we take a look into a particular segment of that. And if it is too long, because of the second condition um, here, we conclude that it becomes just a trivial part. And then we are ending up with a string with a open, uh, then we will end up with an open string. And then we can apply the first condition, which is a delete condition. And the open end of the string will be very sharp. So we will just deform it away until we arrive at the trivial operator. So the amazing thing about this is that, uh, first of all, uh, alpha bar is a minus alpha modulo d in general. It turns out that the commutation relation and the deformability condition, which was the first two conditions that I introduced in the previous slide, uh, constrains um, the stabilizer generator in a very peculiar way. And I have to, make uh, I have to let you know that uh, the generator here and the generator here corresponds to a different code. Uh, in, uh, so they are completely different code. And as you can see, um, they are either symmetric or anti-symmetric uh, uh, under the inversion operation. And there's also this extra constraint that the symplectic product between the, the parameters of the quantum code, which is alpha, beta, and gamma, delta, should not be equal to 0, which is a fairly um, simple constraint that you can check, by, check with your hands. So uh, from now on, I will denote the code that is represented by this kind of stabilizer generator as a symmetric code, and the second one as an anti-symmetric code. And as you can see, uh, it's basically represented by four parameters, which, is a which are symplectic pairs. So those are eight numbers altogether. And before we get into the detail, uh, I just want to point out there is a equivalent, very nice equivalence relation. Uh, first of which is the lattice symmetry. So if we rotate the lattice, and if we end up with the same quantum code, we should probably count them as the same kind of code. And it turns out that under those lattice symmetry, actually uh, two uh, codes that can, can be identified if, uh, if they can be mapped into each other under the permutation of the parameters of the code. And also, if two codes can be mapped into each other under local unitary operation, especially the local Clifford transformation, then again, you can identify those two codes as a same one, which is again represented by a special linear group of um, a two by two special linear group over a, over a finite field D. And there's one final uh, 
rather exotic uh, equivalence relation, which is a equivalence relation between the symmetric code and the anti-symmetric code. And this is a little bit subtle because uh, if you look at the symmetric code here and the anti-symmetric code here, you can imagine applying a Clifford operation on the second one uh, on the evens layer. So in that case, uh, you will map delta bar into delta and gamma bar into gamma and beta, gamma, beta bar into beta and alpha bar into alpha. And on the next, and, and the, for the stabilized generator behind this guy, uh, we will basically map alpha into alpha bar, beta into beta bar. But since uh, they're basically the same stabilizer generators because uh, if you basically multiply, because uh, basically they only differ by the sign and all that matters is the commutation relation. So you can see that in the bulk, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a correspondence between the symmetric code and the anti-symmetric code, but it turns out that in general, if we have a periodic boundary condition, especially the length uh, in the x direction here is odd. In that case, we cannot, we cannot uh, apply that argument anymore. So it turns out that in that case, those two codes are not, exact, not actually identical. So to summarize a little bit, um, under the lattice symmetry, we can, uh, permu we can basically permute the parameters of the code. So from now on, instead of writing down all the four elements, I'll just denote it as a set, which is a set of alpha, beta, uh, set of four parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, or delta. And since uh, there's a local Clifford transformation equivalence, uh, I will again identify two which can be identify each other through a special linear group, ele element of the special linear group. The last one is the really important one because uh, basically when proving the absence of string logical operator, remember there were two conditions, which first of which was the formability condition, and the second one was um, the, the finite aspect ratio. And through these two conditions, we did not assume anything about the boundary condition, right? Which means basically, uh, to prove the absence of string, uh, uh, we only need to uh, study the bulk property of the code. So if you can show that certain symmetry code does not have string logic cooperator, like we can like, gain it for free that there is a corresponding anti-symmetry code without a string logic cooperator. So this is the main result. Uh, so the theorem basically says that the following three conditions on the parameters of the code uh, guarantees an aspect ratio of five for, the, for these two codes. But the important thing is that the ratio is finite because that's where we get the logarithmic energy barrier. And you can see the first condition was a, is a deformability condition, which is expressed very nicely. And the second condition is something that we expect to happen. See, uh, we are looking for quantum codes that does not have any string logical operator, right? And so it is only natural to assume that there is not any string logical operator with uh, widths particularly equal to one. And what's amazing about this condition is that there's this one extra simple condition that really combines all, the, all of them together and guarantees a finite aspect ratio. And so basically, given a quantum code that is uh, represented by these four parameters, you can easily check uh, if, they have, if they are absent of string logical operator. There are a couple of observations that you can make. Uh, it turns out that the previous, um, the, the equations that I introduced in the previous slide does not have any solution when d is equal to two or d is three. But it does have a solution when d is equal to five, uh, which is the following. And uh, it turns out that for sufficiently large number of d, uh, there's always a code that satisfies the condition. And also, um, most importantly, as I constantly advertise, uh, these codes have a logarithmic energy barrier for logical error. And basically, uh, even though uh, Brabi and Haas result related um, was, was about a um, binary stabilizer code, the idea behind proving the logarithmic energy barrier can be uh, exactly extended in the same way. But uh, there might be potential objections, which is that maybe uh, there is no incuticuted at all. Maybe that's why we didn't have any string logical operator. And fortunately, there is a nice response to that, which is that at least for the anti-symmetric code, there is a one encoded cuted. And the way you can see this is that given n cubes, there are n physical cuteds, and there will be n generators. And there is at least one non-trivial constraint between the generators, which is to basically multiply everything. So take a look at this second generator here. And if we multiply everything, for each vertex we have, uh, for each uh, symplectic pair alpha, we have the exact uh, minus sign of that guy, which is alpha bar. So uh, alpha times, 
the generalized Pauli operator represented by alpha and the generalized Pauli operator represented by alpha bar when multiplied together becomes an identity. And the same thing for all uh, the rest of the three of the guys. So that corresponds to one non-trivial constraint on the code. So we will always end up having at least one encoded cuted in this error correcting code. So how does a logical operator look like? Uh, it's conjecture that there is a fractal logical operator. I have to admit this is something that I'm not completely sure about at this point. But uh, when we change the system size, it, it turns out that the ground state degeneracy changes as the system size changes. And apparently the commutation relation between these fractal operators seems to be very hard to compute. But there are very nice uh, logical operators which are non-contractible surfaces that have non-trivial commutation relations with each other. And they have a commutation relation with each other if the intersection length of the surfaces ha is, has intersection length is not equal to zero modulo d, where d is the local particle dimension. And these are the examples. And so the normal vectors of the logical operators are in the x or y or z direction. So for instance, if we try to compute the commutation relation between this guy and this guy, uh, it, will, it will depend on the intersection length between those two, which is a single line. So to conclude, uh, there is a large family of three-dimensional local codes resembling the properties of Haas code. So this tells us that uh, Haas code is not just a fluke. This is a very general property of those, those kind of systems, which have lower energy, energy barrier, which have ground state degeneracy changes with system size, and logical operators that are either, either fractal or membrane. But most importantly, they do not have any string logical operator. And I just want to mention that there is something that I didn't uh, really introduce throughout the paper, which is that uh, even though the theorem does not apply to d equals 3 code, there, uh, there are actually some numerical evidences suggesting that there are some d equals 3 codes with finite aspect ratio. Uh, to be more particular, finite aspect ratio with 3. But I couldn't prove it. So it would be desirable to have a proof for that particular code. And it would be also interesting to see other kind of codes with a, on a different lattice with similar properties. Thank you. So, questions? So you looked at Q pits at the vertices. Uh, of course, uh, Zhang Van Haas has two Q bits. Right. Have you looked at like accommodations like that with a tensor product? Is your technique allowed you look at like a Q um, bit Q trick combination, for example, or two Q tricks? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely possible. But I just wanted to start from the simple example. Actually, the initial motivation was this D, D equals 3 code that I mentioned in the last. And then I tried to generalize it to uh, see if there are any codes that I can prove the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, but the general idea is, yeah, I, the, the um, idea for proving the absence of string logical operator is quite general. It's just that, but it depends on, but whether I can prove it or not depends on the parameters of the code. So yeah, I will have to see, actually see the code to see if I can come up with something similar or not, but uh, the, the method is quite general, yeah. So your method should then easily or not easily then be able to look at qubits and qtrit combinations. So basically, um, the way I prove this is to map the problem into a linear algebra problem, which is basically rank of certain um, matrices, <coughs> matrix. And reducing to that problem is trivial. It's the same. But given that matrix, uh, proving, uh, counting the rank might be an easy problem or may not be an easy problem. So that's where the difficulty is coming in. I see. Mm. Other questions? One. Speaker. 